The story of Persona 4 focuses itself, with more integrity than perhaps any other game I've ever seen, on the mythos surrounding Japan's creation and folk history. Fitting of the small town stuck in the past nature, everything from the personas to the fictional locale to the antagonists all feed into information and build on ideas found through the Kojiki, Nihong Shoki, and Isega Naru with striking consistency, while still finding ways to tie these stories to the modern struggles and conventions of its cast and everlasting message. In this segment, I am going to now analyze how Persona 4 pulls this off in detail, focusing on the plot, narrative, themes, and mythology, giving as little game summary as I think is comfortable to get to know these connections that are present. I think it's important to introduce the characters at play and setting first and foremost to give an idea of things in Persona 4. Persona-wise, the player character is Izanagi, part of two who helped create Japan and create the flood of gods that inhabit it today. I'll go into the pieces of his legend as they become relevant to the story. If you've seen the other videos I've made, then you may already know this, but if not, this segment will not cover deep dives into any characters not present or connected to the main story of Persona 4, and it will not deep dive into any elements that are not directly and necessarily tied to that story, as those are present in other segments and I don't want to be redundant. If you didn't know, watching this segment by itself does serve as a standalone video, but if you want a detailed look at nearly every social link, every dungeon, and so forth, I have other standalone segments for those too. So please, if you enjoy, please consider subscribing and supporting me through Patreon or on PayPal through Twitch. This is only one of an over 30 part series analyzing every aspect of Persona 4. And so without further ado, here's the story. Upon the original return from Yomotsu Hirasaka, The Underworld, he sought purification, and during the purification process, from washing his body, gave birth to so many more gods. A few of so being Suzano, Amaterasu, and slightly differently, a god of purification itself, Haraedo no Okami. These, of course, are the ultimate personas of Yosuke, Yukiko, and Chie as we know them. They did not awaken to their personas and grow except through him taking them to the TV world. And so, as he literally takes the leadership of the investigation team, he also takes the metaphorical and mythological role bringing them into being as the original god he stands for did. The setting of Inaba does not take place in real-life modern Inaba, Japan, though. It's instead based on a mythical town outside Mount Fuji, to be specific, the Reiseki and Nakayama mountain in myth. In real life, Inaba is based on the Isawa Onsen Station and area of Fuefuki City in Yamanashi Prefecture. This includes the said station, as well as the main shopping street, the shrine, and floodplain all featured in Inaba. Okina Station as well. This is the real-life Inaba of Persona 4. The name of Inaba itself comes from a mixture of both the Isega Naru and Kojiki versions of the story, The Hair of Inaba, which gives name and context to the entire area. The Hair of Inaba in the Kojiki is about a trickster rabbit that, after having his fur bitten off by an alligator, runs into 80 brothers who are all seeking to attempt the princess's hand in marriage. An 81st brother, who tagged far along and far behind under the weight of his brother's luggage, also moved en route under their command. The first 80 brothers convinced the rabbit to roll in salt water and dry himself in the cold, harsh winds of the mountains, greatly hurting and disturbing the rabbit for their enjoyment. When the 80 brothers had moved on, and the youngest brother stumbled across along the path, the youngest brother gave good advice to the rabbit, and the rabbit recovers. From there, the rabbit reveals himself to actually have been a god, and sets his youngest brother up to marry the princess. This boy became known as Okuinushi, descendant of Suzano. The 80 brothers with their descendants' blood are actually all forms of weak gods due to their lineage, and so Yaso Inaba, or Yasogami Hai, refers to all of them. The kanji making up Yaso refers to 80, and Gami refers to gods. Yasogami High then is literally the high school of the 80 gods, tying it back to this myth. An additional tenuous connection could also be made that since the people we know in Persona 4 who go to Yasogami High are descendants in Ego, or Persona, of the gods, who due to Suzano's connection with Izanagi makes them all technically the same descendancy, like the Yasogami. There's still more ways the story plays into the hair of Inaba though, and they're much more significant than what we've covered so far, so we'll get into that. The first kidnapped person by Namatame was Yukiko, or Amaterasu, and the result of pursuing Namatame as the kidnapper led them to realize the truth and face the real villain as well in Persona 4. 
I mention this because Namatame is the hair of Inaba. He's the rabbit. Upon tricking the public, the sharks, he was discovered for his adultery and had his skin bitten off. But going to the Isegan Naru version of the story of the hair now, that story describes the hair as biting the clothes of Amaterasu and taking her away through the mountains to a plain up on high, alongside her entourage of gods and men following her. It was Yukiko's kidnapping that caused the investigation team to properly understand their mission and pursue the rabbit Namatame. Along the way, their entourage contains both gods and men, historical figures like Naoto's ultimate personas and kanjis, as well as previously mentioned gods of other crew members. This mountain plain that they rest at is the Isega Naru, the mountain plain up on high. Only after traveling the land are they able to see the land from now up on high and confront their answer. Namatame's truck as well, the Inaba Kyubin, or the Inaba Town Express Delivery Service, has a white hair on it to drive home that Namatame is indeed the hair of Inaba. Late in the game, you convincing the group to hear him out also can be analogous to the 81st brother coming to the rabbit's aid while the others surround it with varying levels of hostility. The fact that Yosuke in particular wants to throw the rabbit in, and that Yosuke specifically is Suzano, also connects him to the ego of the Yasogami in the original myth more strongly. So that's the hair of Inaba and how it ties into the mythology of the setting and central plot. This is only a side bit though. The actual story is a retelling of the myth started in the Kojiki, the story of Izanami and Izanagi. I already mentioned how the original starting cast directly tie into Izanagi in a relevant way, but I haven't really expanded upon that much more. As you probably know, Izanami is the game's main antagonist, and the one truly pulling the strings in Persona 4 Golden. The game even sort of reminds you of the story in a tongue-in-cheek way by having Edogawa give you the general summary on the Persona 3 trip. And his choice wording in some places I'll be referring back to in a moment as I give my own account of the story with details I believe are important from the Kojiki. Here's what I believe you need to know about the story. Izanami and Izanagi, in love, and great gods of Japan, give birth to the fire god Kagatsuchi. Kagatsuchi slays Izanami, and in vengeance, Izanagi takes the blade of Totsuka and slays Kagatsuchi into eight pieces. These pieces form gods of their own, although not linked to the consciousness of the original whole. From the blood was born Take Mikazuchi, Kanji's original persona, who I talked about in their own segment. If you want to see those, again, by the way, and they aren't uploaded already, like many other things I'm likely going to be referencing in this video, please just keep the bell on and subscribe, they'll be uploaded in due time. The Blade of Totsuka, as I've mentioned elsewhere, is also available in Persona 4 Golden. It's the sword that you recover off the Reaper and is similarly Yu Narukami's ultimate weapon, just like Izanagi. After slaying Kagatsuchi, Izanagi wishes to go to the land of Yomi, or the place of the dead, the underworld, in order to bring Izanami back. Going on his journey, he enters the underworld to meet her again. The larger path of the underworld is Yomotsu Hirasaka, the name of the final dungeon location in the game. Once he gets to Izanami, she tells him in the dark that she will negotiate with the god of the underworld to come back to life. So Izanagi starts to leave, but despite her insistence, becomes curious as to what Izanami looks like, wanting to see his loved one alive again. She asks that he cast his eyes away from the truth, but instead he lights his comb ablaze and sees her dead body covered in maggots, rotting. Izanami is so embarrassed and outraged at Izanagi, choosing not to avoid the cruel truth of reality, that she chases him out of Yomotsu Hirasaka with some demons that I mentioned in Chie segment, and eventually leaves a vengeful curse on the world as Edogawa even mentioned. So for the parallels. Similarly, when Izanami exposes herself to the player, she seemingly has bandages wrapping around her, seeming clean and proper before a later phase exposes her rotting self in similar form. A common move that she uses during her fight as well is Vengeful Curse, a reference to her actions as Izanagi left. Near the end of the fight, she starts to use a scripted move, Thousand Curses, which slowly removes all of your party from you, presumably killing them or dragging them down into the land of the dead. This is a reference to Izanami's claim that her curse will take 1,000 human souls every day as part of her curse, and Izanagi responds that if that is so, then he will produce 1,500 to sustain humanity's growth. In the myth, Izanagi sets his coma blaze for light, 
This comb is the one that Marie has and struggles to recall the memory of in her own link, and she is part of Izanami like the Sagiri. She's Izanagi's ego, the positive reflection and the want to grow. Some things Edogawa mentioned specifically is the travel to the land of Yomi, and he specifically words the underworld in that it is a land of shadows, which is of course no coincidence, as within the shadow world of the human subconscious, Yomoto Hirasaka makes appearance in the game. The shadow version of Yomoto Hirasaka is of course only possible to exist in the land of shadows currently, because Izanami exists as a shadow. She is cognition, an idea conjured by human archetype, and lacks an ego to properly pull her powers into reality, being why she has to go about it in such a convoluted way with the Sagiris and Marie. If you want to understand more about the Sagiris and Marie as well, they have their own segments for viewing. Seriously, I I've made so many videos on this, check them out! Going with the general themes of Persona games, the aim of the antagonist god position is to test humanity. They have their idea about who or what or why mankind is, and now you, being selected as the fool, must disprove this belief and rend from whatever subconscious being affronting you's idea of humanity is, giving people the ability to face life with the possibility in their own hands. The god Izanami then represents the fog, or the aversion to truth, the willingness for stagnation and the desire of mankind not to confront the harsh realities that face them. This comes from a part of the tale where Izanagi, despite the horrible possibilities that could lay in the darkness, chose to light his comb anyways and see the decaying lover in the dark, having to face what she truly was, that she was truly dead. She, even after being dead, failed to accept her appearance and tried to guide Izanagi not to as well. And now, when he fails to, she aggresses directly toward him. You, as the player, are then also tasked with reaching out to the truth to prove to whatever being may be watching that humans are powerful enough that they can be left to their own devices to seek or deny truth, that it is a moral good to give them that option. You prove your ideals by beating her, but you see this behavior throughout the game as well. Izanami tries to send things your way that make you doubtful of the pursuit of truth, the purpose or virtue of it, or even making you doubt what it even is. From Adachi's bait-and-switch definitions, to the cruel truths of Mitsuo Kubo, to the disasters led by uncritical belief in truth like Namatame, the amount of times that you feel led to a dead end, and even an appeal to the masses. Izanami attempts to make many arguments throughout the game, convincing you not to look, not to continue searching, but after you have pressed her again and again, at the end of the game, she feels she no longer has any choice but to aggress you directly. She realizes that while you live, you will not stop questioning, seeking, and understanding. The full theme overview will be covered in its own segment near the end, but for now, this is the mythological and thematic analysis of the things Persona 4 Golden presents the player. Now then, let's talk about the actual, literal story and how it's told, the decisions made, and how they contribute to the narrative. Persona 4 Golden starts with you, a popular city boy, getting sent to the country with your uncle and his daughter for the next year. Something that Persona 4 initially does to set up the feeling of the small town is by having introductory cutscenes that show the characters walking home from school. Probably due to monotony, they cut the more specific residential cutscenes once the message is sent, but you get the idea of this not quite backwards but a little stuck in the past town, surviving on its own but facing difficulty acclimating to the new century. With Juness, the Walmart equivalent, moving in and uprooting many long-handled businesses, and with the shrine falling into low usage, the town starts reaching on to some sort of stagnation. Upon arriving, the death of Mayumi Yamano and Saki Konishi happened back to back and almost out of nowhere. There's a bustle and concern from everyone. There's a morbid sense of excitement that the people are waiting for. This kind of gossip, of discussion, bring people into an energy rather than, or in conjunction with, the horror that it is. You even see this with things like Yosuke's character arc, as after the Midnight Channel rumor has happened, the initial three stumble their way into the personas of the Shadow World. Persona 4's intro is definitely long for getting into the action. Things are pretty much entirely on the rails for the first hour and a half if the person is actually reading, listening, and taking their time as intended. Then, the game doesn't even properly open up until another hour or so when Yukiko's dungeon is in full force. This is definitely one of the weakest points of the game, 
But for a heavily story and character focused game that's going to sit you through a medium paced 70 to 80 hours or so, this is comparatively reasonable for an opening. Yosuke's Awakening, gameplay wise, is really well handled, in its preciseness for the gameplay. They give you one tutorial fight that lets you understand the central mechanic of normal versus weak attacks and make sure that you can use the one more system before throwing you into a boss fight and accustoming you to the guard system, explaining non-fatally that bosses will normally have extremely powerful attacks that you will have to watch for tells and prepare for, most easily with guarding. In two fairly straightforward fights that are neither too short nor irritatingly long, it manages to give you an idea of all the system's mechanics for fighting that you can slowly expand on with your own curiosity later. Later is once you're in Yukiko's dungeon. Briefly after obtaining your first couple demons, you'll be introduced to fusion, so the way that the game doles out things on a gameplay perspective is fairly well paced, I think. The biggest thing that makes it take a while is the added amount of characterization lines that add very little to the story or even of the characterization, and for players who may not find the immediate cast's personalities palatable for them personally, they may feel turned off to Persona 4. I think that's the biggest risk with the game, considering Yosuke, Chie, and Yukiko by far have the most defined and prominent flaws of the central cast in terms of negative traits. Still, facing yourself or facing the truth, understanding yourself and reality as is instead of how you want to perceive it as, and how that ultimately leads you to be the most empathetic, understanding, and rational, practical person you can be, is clearly laid out as the central goal of the game. The first few dungeons serve a general purpose of endearing you slowly to the cast, while they deal with the forward and backward momentum of solving the case while being in a position of seemingly helpless ignorance. Still, each dungeon does do something significant for the central narrative. From Yukiko, they learn how to spot a victim before their kidnapping and rescue them. They deduce women who show up on the TV and are connected to the other previous victims are the people that are targeted. With Kanji, they rule out the women part of their theory, but connect the TV and victim connection angle, this time trying to warn Kanji beforehand, but failing to get through to him. Next is Risei, which they fall back on their theory with again, now with the victims seemingly having no connections after all, and just being a coincidence. They ascertain that victims who appear, whose names and faces are recently broadcast on TV, is actually how they're being targeted. This time, they also get closer, and are able to genuinely warn the person about the possible oncoming danger before the act happens. But while they are able to improve themselves in both criteria and action to get through to her, it does little to help. Each dungeon, each attempt, causes them to form and readjust their theory, taking one step closer to the truth, and getting one step better at preventive measures. But you also see the occasional frustration, as it seems every time they narrow the idea, it gets disproved, and they get back to where they started on some regard, and remain lost in the dark. This is an intentional aspect of the main narrative of the story, though. It's part of the pressure that Izanami is putting on to see if humans will give up the truth whenever it seems unattainable. Seeing humans struggle with their unattainable truth, seeing if they will give up. Showing no signs of slowing down, she sends the message through other Teddy, about how the truth may be grasped at, but the grasper will have no means of seeing it as truth. They push past this and are faced with something completely new, Mitsuo Kubo, claiming he is a murderer and egging them on. There is an unsettling bit of the game after this point where the team is unsure if they even caught the right culprit and they just have to wait for the police's decision. Every free day after retrieving Mitsul, the game badgers you about having to wait until the police are done now, it is meant to send the investigation team into a forced standstill, a place where they momentarily have to just fester and deal with things, unable to search further for the truth. Will they give in to complacency and feel content with their hollow victory? Will they take this convenient truth as reality? Something that ended up trapping Namatame, and something Adachi claims that you are actually in later on? No. The investigation team is still skeptical, so Naoto makes herself an intentional target, so hopefully they can ascertain a greater method and information of the killer. Naoto's sacrifice reveals, again, less than they hope. But they did get some things. They ascertained it is a kidnapper, presumably one person. Someone strong, almost certainly a man, and someone with a TV within a short distance. This is a lot of information, but nothing as concrete as they hoped. Before the next arc with Nanako, you receive a letter that Dojima sees and takes you away to question you on. 
This is a result of one of two things depending on how the player has made their decisions in the game. If you played a certain way, this is the only thing that you hadn't been honest about in the game, and in your mind with good reason. It also drives into Doljima's character arc with difficulty facing the hard truth about his wife's death. This lack of willingness to be open, critical, but intentional in searching for the truth creates some lack of trust which renders you briefly ineffective as when Nanako is kidnapped. The game's narrative is punishing any semblance of untruthfulness in terms of taking actions to seek the truth directly. At this time, the investigation team finally comes to a conclusion as to how the killer abducts people, and a correct one at that. But even having the truth over this is rendered as a sort of too late, because they made the assumption that a face needed to be shown earlier in the game on TV to make a culprit. When the voice, the idea, the perspective, and the identity being known around town was the actual prerequisite. Well, how are they supposed to know? They weren't, but had they been more cautious, theoretically they could have been ready to prevent it, especially with the info they gathered. From here, you face Namatame, but are surprised to see the dwarf Ame no Kuni instead. They challenge the player and the characters, the needs and wants of mankind, but you don't avert your eyes from the truth. You cast through the lie and destroy one arm of Izanami's reach lashing back against the people who enjoy truth and speak as if they embrace it while truthfully not searching critically outside of themselves to find an answer. Namatame is still seen as the presumed killer, and in a fit of rage, Yosuke sees what makes sense. Others as well, but probably Yosuke most prominently, since he takes the most argumentative role against the player. As I mentioned, this is probably a reference again to the hair of Inaba. At this point, the first seeming climax of the story is happening. One could see the intro through Risei's dungeon as a sort of exposition, and then the rising action being from Mitsuo to Nanako, then the results of Nanako's dungeon to the exposing and facing of Adachi as the first climax. Here, you convince the party to put aside their valid feelings because while they are feeling justified, they can't seek the truth if they allow even the feelings as strong as the death of a child to blind their ability to understand what happened fully. If you fail to reach out to the truth here, you get a bad ending. Nanako dies in the hospital, Teddy never returns, and the fog remains. Game over. You also essentially end the game, killing an innocent, well-meaning man, shaken by months of anxiety, trauma, and confusion just to make yourself feel better. It's a pretty brutal game over. If you do shake them out of it though, if you are able to eventually bring Namatame to his senses and understand his role in things, that he is not the killer, but was under confusion as to how the TV world operated, having never gone in himself until with Nanako, I mentioned earlier the parallels of this in the Haravinaba story and how Namatame is the Haravinaba and how he guides Amaterasu's entourage to the top of the mountain, where they can then seek out a new truth, but here it's also likely a double meaning as a red herring. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but a red herring is actually a fish, not a rabbit. But the wordplay is commonly interrelated and used modernly and commonly to represent a rabbit anyways in other languages. Like Japan, who has taken much of Western culture, phraseology, and even straight up words in the past few decades. The confrontation next is with the true killer, Adachi, who offers the fourth major challenge in the party's ideology. The fourth major attempt by Izanami to get Izanagi to look away. The player defeats Adachi, who is revealed, like Namatame, to be fueled with another aspect of Izanami, Ame no Sagiri, the will of the heavens. Heaven's first fog, who again presses the player on their beliefs, which I go into more again in their own segment. After Adachi, if you're going to get the true ending, you must face the last dwarf of Izanami, the Ego, without the memory, Kusumi no Okami, or Marie, who you meet at the very beginning of the game, and in order to access this, must have been helping seek her true self throughout the game. It's funny that the method of her seeking the truth is in recovering the meaning of the comb as well, since the comb is what allowed Izanagi to see the truth in the original myth. After rescuing Marie from herself, allowing her to grow and move forward as her own person, you are able to set up things as if to end the game. You can end here too, pretty easily. If you choose to return home, you can leave happily. The true culprit is killed after all, right? But the true culprit isn't the biggest issue in need of solving. It isn't the murderer that is the greatest damage to Inaba, it is the mentality that breeds that kind of murderer. 
a mentality that left unchallenged will simply find a replacement for the true culprit. And so you go to fight the originator of this horrible mentality, this mentality of subjective perspective above all else on perspective of calling your uncritical experience the truth with no regard for contradicting evidence. You insist again and again until Izanami eventually reveals herself and finally realizes her only way to stop your pursuit is to prove her ideal of avoidance better by challenging you face to face. It also makes thematic sense that someone so averse to facing the truth would do everything at hand to avoid facing their problem until they could no longer be denied. Her agreement to face you, though, in and of itself, is a way of admittance and defeat, but perhaps she just believes that her place as a god sometimes allows her to face the truth when needed, and it is just humans who are better without. Izanagi and Izanami have the reunitance of centuries, almost as an unofficial sequel to the original Kojiki myth, and again, directly opposed this time, Izanagi defeats Izanami with the truth. He throws off his glasses before committing it, something that the characters have worn due to the fogginess of the Shadow World. In this moment, the player is at a point where they no longer need tools to see through the lies of reality. They are at grips with themselves and can see through and obtain the truth of their own faculties. The fog, the lies, obstruct their view no longer. So the fog is vanquished, the fool gains the power of the world, and humanity again proves itself more powerful strong enough to conquer the faults that some people find themselves drawn to in society. That's the story of Persona 4, keeping in mind narrative progression and detail. I think due to the many scenes with characters getting to know each other and many dungeons early on that despite giving greater insight to the case, never really reach huge breakthroughs, one would be tempted to say that the game doesn't really ramp up until the end. But I think this is fault of not reading or really understanding what the story is trying to do. The constant back and forth, the perseverance under failure, the continued attempt to no matter the seeming hopelessness or unsolvable nature of the case, that is exactly what it takes to reach out to the truth. And life isn't measured in single moments, where suddenly huge breakthroughs are made, but often in the ways that we piece together and understand small aspects of life as they come into our being. They are no less important, but they take more work, and are more gradual. They allow us to build a picture, to see reality. I hope you liked this thematic and mythological analysis of the story of Persona 4, as well as a look on how narrative progression makes sense with the set of ideals and goals at play. If this is one of the first videos you've seen by any chance, I recommend all the other ones may be connected to this video. Please like and comment your thoughts, and of course, if some of the segments you're interested in aren't yet posted, please consider subscribing and turning on the bell to see those videos when they do drop. This whole Persona 4 project, not just this video, has taken four months of my life, with little guaranteed positives at this point, except my enjoyment toward making it. However, unfortunately, I can't eat enjoyment or fuel electric devices with it, so if you would like to fuel my deep effort in me doing this sort of thing, going forward, please subscribe to my Patreon for behind-the-scenes content and group calls, or if you don't like Patreon, consider paying through my PayPal on my Twitch. Thanks so much once again, and see you soon.